So I'd left a message saying that the koala colonies were being bulldozed. Please help us. He said to me, he said, you be careful working out there because there's been a death threat against you. He was definitely talking about shooting Glenn. I did actually try to ring Glenn a couple of times. He um, didn't answer, of course. They all knew about it. They all knew. Glenn was a registered surveyor for many, many years. He was doing a lot of travelling and wasn't spending much time at home. And a job came up within the Department of Land and Water Conservation and, yeah, he was involved with native vegetation and became a compliance officer. He loved going out and talking to farmers. He hated being in the office and his favourite part of the job was to just go out and chat to old mates <laughs> and more often than not be yeah, invited in for a cup of tea and cake or something and he just loved that. Glenn Turner and Robert Strange, his colleague, were environment officers investigating illegal land clearing in the Moree district of New South Wales. Glenn knew the area well and wanted to show Robert around, and they drove up toward the small town of Cropper Creek in the centre of the Golden Triangle, Australia's richest agricultural region. As they were driving, they saw stacks of trees ablaze in the field. They pulled over to take photographs and GPS readings. Glenn knew the property belonged to the Turnbull family and that they did not have permission to clear the trees. He had already prosecuted them for illegal land clearing. They turned left into Telga Lane and stopped twice more to take photographs. Word got back to Ian Turnbull who had been driving one of the bulldozers, that the officers had been seen taking photos in the area. Turnbull drove down Telga Lane looking for them. Robert Strange, seen here in police footage, heard a car pull up and turned around to see Ian Turnbull aiming a rifle at Glenn. And then, without warning, firing the first shot which hit him in the chin. Glenn went down on one knee and then staggered back to his feet. He was bleeding from the face but called out, What are you doing, Ian? Turnbull took aim and fired a second time, hitting Glenn in the shoulder and knocking him to the ground. Glenn moved back towards the vehicle and crouched down near the passenger side door. Robert pleaded with the gunman to stop firing. Turnbull's response was, he's not leaving here unless he's in a body bag. It was just an ordinary day. The day before Glenn was shot, I rang him, or at least he rang me because I'd left a message saying that the koala colonies were being bulldozed. Please help us. And he said, look, I'll be up in a couple of days. I'll call in for a cup of tea. I'm coming in anyway. And he said, Elaine, I've told you before, go to my superiors, go to the media, so we get some action. That's what I did. That night, on the Monday night, I rang a lot of people. I wrote more emails. This was an important koala area. Glenn was working on it 
and he'd already surveyed the area by helicopter. And in some cases, west of the highway, some of the locals said hundreds of koalas would have been killed, that the clearing was so vast. I would sort of work with Glenn, sharing information with him. He was certainly aware of what I was doing as far as collecting information about the illegal clearing, and uh, I was providing that to them. Big bimble box. There must have been a blight. Open forest here. They've cleared it all. This was a large area that's now under crop. I do threatened species research, survey type work. And uh, one of the jobs that I got offered was to do a koala management plan for the Cropper Creek region. The local landholders informed me that they were very concerned about the loss of koala habitat in the Cropper Creek area. And they said the government investigators had been there. They'd done investigation work and you would think that once there's an investigation underway, the clearing would stop. Well, that wasn't the case at all. This man, Turnbull, went about 20 so years ago to the Midwest of America. And they don't have fences, they have white markers for boundaries, not a tree, nothing. You know, he saw it for what it was, big farming, way to go, big machinery. This is what he does, turns grazing properties into cultivation and, uh, and then grows grain on those properties. The Catchment Management Authority was aware that he was buying those properties. They wrote to him and told him that there was koala habitat on those properties and he would not be allowed to clear it. He still had the dozers in there before the contracts were signed. Over a period of a year and, and more, they continued to clear even while they were being investigated, and they knew they were being investigated, of course. Ian Turnbull was very angry and wanted to deal directly with whoever reported it. The game of cat and mouse went on around the vehicle for over 20 minutes. Robert also took cover behind the vehicle. He tried to reason with Turnbull and told him that Glenn was bleeding badly and needed help. Turnbull moved to the rear of the vehicle and fired another shot, which Robert felt as it went past his head. Glenn then got to the back of the car and set off his emergency beacon. I arrived home from work with the children. We got home it was just after six o'clock on the Tuesday night. There was a message on the machine and I thought, that'll be Glenn. When I played it, it was a guy saying this is a message for Glenn Turner um, from Search and Rescue in Canberra that your emergency beacon has been activated, we're trying to locate you, please call us, and left a number. And I didn't think much of it at the time. I thought, oh, maybe it's just been accidentally activated. Robert managed to dial triple zero into his phone. Shortly afterwards, triple zero called him back, but he couldn't pick up the phone because Turnbull was stalking him. He told Turnbull they were not armed and that Glenn had a young family. Turnbull said, you've ruined our family. I did actually try to ring Glenn a couple of times um, just to check. He um, didn't answer, of course. And I thought, OK, I'll ring this police officer and said who I was and um, I even jokingly said, have you located him yet? I, like, I just 
thought it was just a mistake. And they said, um, there's, yes, there's been a shooting, um, Glenn's been shot, and no more information. Thought, okay, I'm gonna have to get organised. I'll probably have to drive somewhere to a hospital to be with him. By about 8.30 that night, we still hadn't heard anything, so I eventually rang Maury Police, as I knew that he was out in that area, and I was put on hold for quite some time. So that caused me to be a little bit alarmed. It was getting dark. Glenn made an escape, trying to run for the cover of nearby trees. Turnbull raised the gun to his eye and fired at his back, knocking Glenn to the ground. Turnbull then said to Robert, you get out of here, I'm going home to wait for the police. He climbed into his ute, turned it around and drove off. Eventually, I was put through to a detective and he broke the news to me over the phone that Glenn was dead. And um, he said, he asked me, did I have someone with me? And I did, I said, yes, and passed the phone over to my sister and by which time the children had heard my end of the conversation and saw my reaction, so my first priority was to get to them and comfort them. It was not a good way to find out. <laughs> Nothing's, no, there's no good way, I don't think, but that was pretty awful. Certainly doing my own investigation work, I, uh, I've learnt to keep my head low, um, but yeah, it's. I guess you, you know those people are uh, are not going to be happy to have you documenting that they're breaking the law. You just know that you could be vulnerable, so yeah, you sort of play it safe, basically. We didn't know anything about it till the evening. We just had a call from a local friend and she said, have you had a, a, an ecologist or someone staying with you? And I said, no. And we didn't know who it was. So I rang Phil Spark to see if he'd pick up the phone and he did. And I, and I said, should I ring, you know? And he said, look, just wait till morning. And by morning we knew it was Glenn because our neighbours had been, been involved. So we knew it was Glenn. Using a GPS Ian Turnbull appeared in Moree Court today charged with murder and was refused bail. Mr Turnbull's family and lawyer had no comment as they left the courthouse. How is Mr Turnbull the link you spoke to? Will he be fighting the charges, sir? I know one of Alison's biggest regrets was that she wasn't with Glenn when he died and that he was out in his own um, for so long and you know, and in danger, and then that he was he was dead and alone overnight um, with just the police and not her around. So, and that's something that you can't ever change. So there was no real way to say goodbye. Alison was looking for a tree to plant so she could look out the window. I think the, the idea was to look out the Glen. So it's not like Glen. This is a tree that will be controllable. So. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I never knew grass was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> First of Glenn, uh, who we knew at uni, who you guys knew in uh, Tamworth. Let's uh, do some shit that Glenn would do. <laughs> so please come forward and, and uh, water this poor tree. We'll need some love, it'll need alcohol, as Glenn always did. He was a tall man. Uh, almost larger than life with a great enthusiasm. He loved his bluegrass music and entertaining and cooking. 
emu was just part of a pack of marauding lads and he would drive the boat for them to water ski or they'd be playing touch football or just going to the pub. He was an ideas man. Some of these ideas were brilliant. Some were bloody bizarre. We met at a singles dinner. He walked in, come straight over to me and put his hand out and says, hi, I'm Glenn. And then just monopolised me and said, um, I'd like you to sit with me at, next to me at dinner. And I did, and we chatted, and we found that we had very similar backgrounds and both growing up in a very small country town. And I just thought, wow, he's just like no one I've ever met before. He was just so confident and sure of himself, but also just a really nice, decent person. And the rest is history. We just clicked and within less than a year, I think, we decided to buy a property together and that's when we moved here. We found this one and for what we wanted, it was just perfect. It had the small cottage on it. Our friends termed it the love shack and we just made it our home. Glenn was constantly saying we need to plant more trees. That was his mantra. In 2002, we planted a thousand little seedlings, a combination of eucalypts and acacias and river red gums and oaks, silky oaks and stuff. So it looks totally different down there. And the idea of that was to help stabilise the riverbank because we do get floods. with the bloody thing as far as, you know, fighting these bastards and paying the bloody uh, fines and whatnot. If they were, is Butler working on those or not? Yeah, no, Sylvester's working on those. Um, he said, well, you know, at this stage, we just don't don't pay anything. He said, they, you know, if you don't pay it, they'll send you to jail. So, you know. Well, I'm in jail. Um, exactly. So yeah. Sylvester said, we're in no hurry to do anything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the main thing is to get the bloody uh, EP and H off, off our bloody back so the boys can go ahead and farm. Yeah. 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 It's still the squatocracy mentality to some degree that, you know, I own this land and therefore I should be allowed to do whatever I like on it and nobody should be allowed to tell me what I should and shouldn't be allowed to do. And I've had landholders tell me as they're driving around that you've just taken that much of my factory away if I can't clear that. I just want justice for Glenn. We'd just like them to plead guilty and get it over with, but I doubt that that's going to happen. Some days are just quite normal. Other days they'll get very, very sad. It could be that they've got something on at school or so it's just something that they want to show their dad and all I can do is hug them and uh, tell them that their dad would be proud of them. It's Alexandra's birthday. It's, it's, um, it was Glenn's birthday three days before hers. It's such an emotional time for her and and Jack's birthday is the day before he got killed. So he has to live with that the rest of his life. When he's celebrating his birthday, he knows his dad got killed the next day. I've had four koalas die of starvation in my care. One koala was a big boy, should have been 10 kilos. He was five kilos. 
We had one with a bullet wound, but that boy was just like this. He almost knew that you were trying to, to help him on his way and, and he'd hold his dear. She was, there was no malice in him at all. They're absolutely precious. You think that you're seeing a lot of koalas, but it's only that they've been compressed into one small area and what we're doing is completely annihilating them in these small patches that are left. And this aggressiveness and, and an obsession with the quantity of land, every square inch, the dams are filled in. Uh, another reason the koalas are finding it hard. From my caring point of view, I'm finding it so desperately hard to get good leaf. And I don't want to see this northern koala, a tough koala, just wiped out. This is terribly important. They're tough, they can live here, but we must give them a chance. And in just a few short years, we've seen it change dramatically. It's been 18 months now since Glenn was killed and the case has been set down for the 4th of April in the Supreme Court in Sydney. I'll be away from home for a few weeks. Um, I have family members who will be taking care of the children here at home. I believe that the defence will try and portray Glenn in a, a negative way. I think they will stop at nothing because I think, you know, they believe that the defendant was hard done by. The politicians need to listen. The way that this act is administered, that's what needs to change. Otherwise this tragedy will happen again and there'll be Two families torn apart forever over a piece of paper, a legislation in Parliament. The problems with the Native Legislation Act are hardly the situation in That's correct. But the frustration that's out there, it's not just my father, it's many people out in rural New South Wales that are extremely frustrated, extremely frustrated with the way it's administered and the act itself. So the defence that they're using is substantial impairment, which used to be diminished responsibility, and extreme provocations. And also they were going to argue tendency, but that was ruled out pre-trial. Um, and that's basically the, um, about Glenn's tendency of behaviour. Uh, and that was ruled out because he was doing a job, an investigative job of a compliance officer, which meant he needed to investigate when people had allegedly broken the law. Walking in there, the courtroom was a lot smaller than I was expecting, so we found that we were sitting a lot closer to him than we thought we would be. And, um, yeah, that, that was a difficult moment. He has no emotion on his face whatsoever. Found it hard to look at him. hard moments this morning that I wasn't expecting. Mrs Turnbull turned up for the first time. I feel like I don't want to yeah. like her or respect her, but then I feel sorry for her. She's on her own in the courtroom and I introduced myself to her. So um, that was hard. I don't think she realises that she was actually sitting next to, you know, Glenn's wife and sister. So I just thought it was the right thing to do. And actually to hear Mr Turnbull stand up and say he wasn't guilty of murdering Glenn when we know he you know, shot at him at 40 minutes until he killed him, it was really hard to hear. I actually went back after that incident and found this guy was still illegal clearing. So from, from the impact point of view, a lot of the vegetation that he was clearing was actually a, an endangered ecological community. 
and there was a lot of koala habitat in the area as well. And there was probably another five or six threatened species that were being impacted that we knew of. I want to show you the exactly this scene in 2016. So this is what was here originally in 2008. Then we did 2013, which is straight after that clearing in August of 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, that particularly will not be there well, when we take the this, modern... In that time, it is quite shocking that the clearing continued, even though there was a court case, he'd been fined. It's gone from quite an extensive piece of habitat to virtually nothing. It was a really unexpected feeling of um, seeing the jury. It, it feels like our life is in their hands. We both went out and bought waterproof mascara <laughs> after like day one or two yeah. and um, of pre-trial, because we've been down here three weeks now. And we both went, well, this isn't good. But once the media turned up and because um, we, you know, cry, we, we, you know, we've got to try not to be too responsive in court. They've advised us that, that if we are to emotional and it disturbs the jury that we can be asked to leave and not able to return for the rest of the trial. And it could also be seen as leading the jury, which could lead, lead to a dismissal of the jury and starting again. It's really upsetting to repeatedly hear how much support the murderer has in Moree from farmers that think that he's done the right thing. I, I still can't comprehend that he has uh, I don't want to say support, I, I think everyone should have the right for support, but I don't see how anyone thinks what he's done is, is right. That's not the right way to change laws that you don't like. Uh, a polluter who dumps, you know, kills 20 kilometres of the river uh, doesn't have a lot of community support. Someone who clears a thousand hectares of land out at Moree is somewhat seen as a, uh, a good farmer. There's this club a boys club of farmers that have this same sort of attitude to, to clearing and I know that both the federal and state investigators have been onto that area and done investigations and, and yet it was still happening which was really quite perplexing. There was corrupt stuff going on, there was obviously people who had political power of some description um, that, that could get things stopped, you know. They could hold up compliance staff and prevent compliance staff from doing their job. The department actually, he, he said it's almost ghostly quiet. Oh. He said they realised that you were a well-respected man of the district yep. and he said they are ghostly quiet. Yeah, well, I'm glad you got in touch with them because I know both they've, they've been through it all trying to clear and, and bloody yeah. with, you know, with dealing, dealing with the bloody bastards, so, yeah. 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 There's more ruthlessness and unscrupulous behaviour in a big business mindset that wasn't here in farming ever before. It's quite obvious to us that it wasn't just Ian who had thought about this. There was a, a, an arrogance with the amount of land he owned. He wanted so badly to have the family dynasty. It's a very older generation thing to have complete control. Yeah, I reckon that the act should be that uh, the new LS, which includes the Guadalupe Valley Catchment Authority and the Department of Education and the, and the Shire should be in it, and yeah. try and get some of the power away from this bloody uh, Office, yeah. of, of, uh, office of Heritage and Environment. Yeah. There are guys out there who don't give a damn and they'll just, you know, you rock up to their place to do compliance and they've got Queen's Council sitting at the bloody kitchen table. You know, they've got lots of money. They give donations to both sides of politics. There was a great obsession with getting more land and who can have more land and, and it was about the fact that a little bit of a push and we'd go. We've been ostracised to some extent, so we feel um, we don't belong, perhaps. We've had wires cut in the spray coop. We can't prove it. We've had dirt put into a pump so that it didn't work. We can't prove it. 
drill bits put in my tyres when I was down there on my own at one of the children's presentation nights. And we've had the front mailbox Dad made pulled out twice, um, the, the front entrance ripped out. And we felt that it was not just our, our wildlife and koala interests that had us being picked on, but it was, it was the fact that we are smaller, ready to retire. Someone said the other day, oh, you'll sell and it'll all get cleared. And I said, not while there's breath in my body. But it is a difficult one because we should be able to retire and hand it on. We want to leave a legacy of sustainable farming and robust environment. That's all we've ever wanted. Bloody Anderson. I mean, the bastard there, he just wants... The sooner he sells his farm and gets out of the area, the better. Yeah. It seemed to me that it must have been a personal vendetta against Glenn. I do remember Glenn talking to me about Ian Turnbull threatening him. He was definitely talking about shooting Glenn and, um, and saying that he was an old man and he could... Um, there's not much you could do to him because he, his life expectancy wasn't that great anyway. And I know that Glenn found that um, quite intimidating because he took it seriously and uh, I guess in his mind he believed Ian Turnbull capable of, perhaps not murder, but certainly capable of uh, violence at that time. He suggested he'd probably get out on bail and um, just live in comfort till he died before any trial happened. So it was kind of really bizarre. The way that buddy uh, Nadal is carrying on, he, no. he, he must have known he overstepped the mark anyway. Well, oh, well, he's just a nasty week at work. Yeah, he's yeah, just a sneaky snob and a bloody snake in the grass. Mm. I don't know why the hell they can't get rid of him. I had a death threat made to me. I did, it wasn't made to me personally. It was made to my manager. A third party, he'd been present and he said to me, he said, you be careful working out there because there's been a death threat against you. And I went, oh, you mean against staff? And he went, no, 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 I don't mean against staff in general. I, he said, you, you were named. And this manager had A, not told me and B, was aware that I was working out that way. So I wasn't even advised to be on my guard. It is scary. You live in a small town and you do this sort of work. You can't hide. People know what you do for a living. I do worry that if I put my horses in that front gully, that, you know, that someone might take a pot shot just to spite me. I don't go out on the road walking. I don't, you know, I have taken the horses out there late evening, but I, I just think that I'm wary. They brought on a witness who was driving along Talga Lane when um, Rob flagged him down. I really felt for him because yeah. he's a Maori boy and now he's giving evidence against the Turnbulls, a power, powerful... Mm. Well, yeah. he, his evidence is really secondary in that. Jeremy, they make death threats against people that stand up for koalas. What do you think they're going to do? You know, I, I, just, I just really feel yeah, for I him. He's got to stay living in that community. Yeah. In the early days where we had a strong sense of community and certainly there were smaller farms, we had a feeling of if we look after the environment, it'll look after you. Now we're seeing um, an aggressive industrialisation of agribusiness. They want a quick revenue and they're not worrying about the legacy in future years. We've got a big problem. I think people are making decisions on an individual farm basis. There's no broad scale landscape view. We've lost a perspective on sustainability and it means that 200 year old trees are disappearing out of the landscape and they're not going to come back. Um, it's, it's going to be a problem for us in 10, 15, 20 years time. We have cleared up to 90% of woodlands west of the divide, 90%.
we have got less than 5% of native grasslands left west of the divide. That's a huge area of New South Wales of natural environment that's been completely obliterated for cropping and grazing. And one has to wonder how much more these people want. Rob Strange's evidence was very strong and resisted attempts by the defence to lead his evidence in certain directions. The defence suggested that possibly Glenn had crossed the boundary fence and entered uh, Turnbull's lands, uh, which would have been an illegal thing to do because at that point they had no authority to do so. They were outside the property having seen fires burning. Glenn was an experienced officer and was a, one of the more senior officers. So broad experience, very professional, um, and a, a reputation as, as a, you know, someone who would work hard and was getting the job done. What we're trying to win here is that Turnbull did this in cold-blooded murder, not because he, he was depressed, demented, that he'd been pushed by the OEH. He murdered Glenn because it was impacting his financial situation. That's it. Mum was saying about uh, the 200 grand we gave you for that old, old header. Yeah, uh, Kathy. Kathy wanted to know what, how you wanted it worded in your books. Was it a, was it a loan? Was it a, you've got a share of the, of the 8230? Was it a, a, a gift? She said, or was it a case of, you know, you, you put in a fictitious invoice uh, to, you know, for payment of it over a few years or what? Yeah, something like that. Eh? As long as yeah. you know, I don't have to pay tax on it. Yeah, all right. Sure, then. sure. Had a young machine. I'm, I'm, I'm fucked and finished. I won't be driving them again. So as long as there's no tax on my or your part, if you can you dodge around that. Yeah, all right then. Yeah. I see Ian Turnbull as uh, as a very arrogant man. His demeanour in court. Uh, he sits quite comfortably. Let's say he watches the proceedings. Uh, for a man who's 81 years old, he, he appears very healthy. He doesn't ever seem to tire or, or uh, fade or fall asleep. Um, he seems to be lucid and watching proceedings very carefully from start to finish throughout each day of the trial. I mean, the bastard there, he just exerts his power over and above what the Native Vegetation Act is. Yeah. yeah and if you don't know him at the end, he always says, oh, by the way, I'm Glenn Turner, as though he's somebody bloody special, or he was anyway. So. Yeah, 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 so I wrote that down this morning. I thought I'd get off my chest and I'll tear it up and put it in the bloody bin. Monday morning, first thing, they say we're calling Ian Turnbull. And it was mainly about what a bully Glenn Turner was. That's all we heard. The judge said to Mr Alexis, your defence is substantial impairment. How can you run a substantial impairment case without even asking um, the accused what he was thinking and feeling at the time he committed the crime? So he gave Mr Alexis time to think about it and then had a break and they came back and decided to pull him back onto the stand. He'd been working all day. He'd been told that Turner was around. That was the call he got. Turner was around. And he said, don't worry, I'll go and check out what he's doing. He had his rifle under his seat in the ute. He stopped the truck to get it out and put it in the back of the ute. So it was easier for him to get access to it. Um, that's the first time we've heard that. And to me, that was like, wow, you then it really is premeditated because you, you know you were going to you knew you were going to use that rifle so you were just trying to make it easier for yourself when you got there in the last year year and a half where 
people think, oh, well, the laws mustn't exist anymore or something like that, and, and they're getting mixed messages. It would seem that they're being told by someone in, in authority that it's, it's OK and we're going to change the laws and we're going, it's going to be all right. No, someone said that there's, a, there's some, a bill coming up in the New South Wales Parliament. Yeah. There's been push from certain sectors, interest groups, to change the legislation. Possibly some of them may not actually understand how well the last legislation was working or could have worked if it was better resourced. But there's been a lot of political action behind the scenes to force a government to make a decision to change the act. I have never been to any meeting where anyone has said, let's go back to the old ways of doing things. It is simply, let's get something that is workable. It has to be made workable. There was concern that it might weaken the regulations that took 20, 30 years to bring in. At a time also of climate change, when we're trying to reduce our carbon emissions across Australia, if it relies on self-assessment, then obviously, you know, how are you going to test whether that self-assessment is being done accurately or not? Farmers go about their, their business, uh, but we don't, don't try to skirt the law. Okay, thank you. The main push for change is probably coming from agribusiness, large farmers with large land holdings. And these people, they can clear a patch of bush, get quite a few years of carbon in the soil, they can grow wheat or other crops on it for a while, um, and then they can move on to another patch. And it's a little bit like mining the soil. Really, when you look at it, it's short-term money. Could have been at home four weeks ago yes. without him repeatedly arguing extreme provocation when there's no grounds for it. We just go home at weekends, so I feel like I just live here and visit at home weekends. It's awful. I, I don't like it at all. I hate being away from them. But, you know, I say to them, look, you know, we're getting close to the end now and do understand that I need to do this for Dad. And, and they do, they, they really do understand that. heart-wrenching when I have to leave them after being home for a weekend and I can see how much they don't want me to go. The defence case currently is based on substantial impairment, so that's to prove that Mr Turnbull was depressed and he was so overwhelmed with all the prosecutions from the OEH that were unfair that he just didn't make a rational decision. Uh, Mr Turnbull held Len and Mr Strange there for, was about 40 minutes, and he did that all calmly, and he admitted he did that calmly. Then he just went home um, and waited for the police. He didn't ring for help. He didn't ring the police to tell him he'd done that. He'd, he'd left Rob Strange there, who was a mess, to take care of Glenn and try and get help in an area that's not covered by mobile, mobile phone most of the time. Um, and we found out today that his grandson was already at the house and knew about that he'd killed Glenn. He said, I put a couple of bullets into Turner. 
they all knew about it. They all knew, the farm hands, the, the farm manager, the grandson, they all knew, not one of them, not one of them rang an ambulance, not one of them rang the police. In fact, the farm manager drove past and didn't bother to stop. You have a duty to the man who died trying to do what so many of us want, but not game to speak up and say for fear of going against the tide. So many small businesses who want the custom of these big 30, 40,000 acre places, you know, it's natural. And, and many of the managers, or four lots of managers and their wives who were distraught with the loss of koalas, but they didn't want to lose their jobs. Friday, 27th of May. It's my husband's birthday today, so here I am, still in Sydney, eight weeks after we started. Um, yesterday, the jury finally went out um, at about five past two in the afternoon. We didn't realise that the jury can choose to stay in past session times, and sessions usually finish at one on Friday. We were devastated just afternoon when we heard that, that they were choosing to stay till four o'clock um, I was sitting next to Alison and it was just like the life force went out of us. We just thought, we don't know what to do because we knew we wouldn't be able to change our flights. Um, Jack and Alexandra have really crumpled this week. Uh, it's been really difficult for Alison particularly. Um, you know, they, they just want her to be home and she had to tell them that she won't be home tonight. If a verdict comes in this afternoon and we're not here after being here eight weeks, we just don't think we'd cope with that really, so. Mum's been here all week. You know, she really wants to be here and she really wanted to be here for the verdict. Uh, but just put her in a cab. My cousin's taking her to the airport. So we have just been sitting at a cafe or upstairs with the, uh, the police and the DPP waiting because we don't get much notice. We only get a few minutes notice to go back to the courthouse. Even if he gets not guilty of murder, he'll get guilty of manslaughter, but we don't want that. Oh, I want guilty of murder, because it is. It's a murder. And um, if they just gets manslaughter, then no, it'll be a much lesser sentence. After less than a day of deliberations, a jury found 81-year-old farmer Ian Robert Turnbull guilty of murder. We're never going to be able to fill the void that's been left in our lives. But we got a, the right result. The jury rejected his defence. He was mentally unwell. It's completely cleared like a table here. The native grasses have gone, the lime bushes, the threatened species are gone. So it's not just about the koala, but those koalas love that particular patch. We haven't got that corridor of connectivity. There's nowhere here. We haven't got big enough continuous areas. We're going to lose them from these areas. Over the head, sweetheart. Quicker. Now, if I fall, catch me. <laughs> the beautiful, strong society and colonies has been disrupted to a point where they're just nomadic. And I don't think we can release koalas here anymore. It is so, so disturbed now that we won't have the koala here except in isolated elderly male koalas or the occasional female. So we have a real problem. We won't let you smother. There you are, big boy. 
You are going to be our alpha male, aren't you? When change happens rapidly, nature doesn't handle it very well, and the koalas are not handling it very well. Good boy. Here we go. Five kilos for Billy. So we've got Billy at five, Jane at four, and Beck at four. Drought is a major problem with them. They have to have water when it's hot like this. We're putting them into an area that is risky because we can't replicate their, their complex society, but we're doing it to the best of our ability with all the advice we can. It's probably just the tip of the iceberg because when we lose the koala, we've lost a lot of ecosystem services that have been helping the farming. We've got big monocultures in our industrial farming, and now we haven't even got any local insects and birds to help us out in many cases. It's a murder and um, might even just get out of jail, who knows, for time already served and his age and so-called medical conditions. I impose an aggregate sentence of imprisonment for 35 years. A de facto life sentence for Ian Turnbull. He is 81. Ma'am, was it a tough sentence for you here to hear today? It's probably more than we'd even hoped for. We, we, we hoped that he'd die in, in jail, to be honest, because Glenn didn't get a chance to go home to his family. Justice Johnson found that even in the category of murder, this is about as serious as it gets, mostly because Glenn Turner was a public official serving his community and that his murder diminished us all as a society. And I think the other two people that really need to be remembered are Jack and Alexandra. They needed to know that the murderer was put in jail for the rest of his life. They asked us that a lot. It's not there. <laughs>